Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. We are so excited um, to, for, to yet another digital collections track. Uh, this track is facilitated by my, my, my colleague Larry, who is a resource sharing librarian at Stanford University, and myself, Winnie. I head the Library and Documentation Center at Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Access Authority in Uganda. Uh, we have our second session today, and our last session will be on Friday. We're especially excited about the projects in this track uh, because digital collections are more important than ever in our current environment. They make glam institutions more accessible to a broader audience. Uh, Lake data is so crucial for making connections within and across collections, but that can bring, of course, challenges on, or of its own when working with heterogeneous sets of metadata. Um, discover the workflows, tools, and models that projects in this track have used to successfully create and manage linked data, as well as improve discovery in digital collections. Uh, you will find uh, links to the full conference schedule on the screen that has been shared by Larry, and also a link to the conference website the Twitter, the Twitter handles, the Slack invites, and also the different uh, Slack channels that uh, we can interact with. Uh, we are also following the LD4P community participation guidelines, which are also linked um, on the website. Uh, in case you have any question you would like to ask uh, or make a, a comment following today's presentations, uh, you may raise you may use the Zoom raised hand feature if you'd like to speak, or also use the Q&A panel to ask uh, written questions. I now invite my colleague Gary to introduce the, our speaker. Thank you. We'd like to introduce Greer Martin and her lightning talk, um, Looking Beyond LC Wikidata for Metadata Reconciliation and Enhancement. Greer is the Metadata Technologies Librarian at Loyola University Chicago, where she coordinates metadata interoperability across platforms. She has written and presented on metadata cleanup and authority reconciliation and has managed metadata migration projects for libraries and archives. Thank you so much for joining us today, Greer. Uh, thanks, Hillary. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, so as Hillary said, today I'm going to talk about Wikidata for Digital Collections Metadata Remediation. And so I've um, kind of divided this into two sections. Um, first, I'm going to talk about a mapping project that um, leveraged the technical benefits of Wikidata for um, data cleanup and enhancement. And then I'm going to talk about um, what I see as some potential uses of Wikidata to incorporate community names um, into our digital collections. So to begin with the mapping project, last year I worked with a couple of librarians to help a faculty member migrate their website to WordPress. Um, so this website is a crowdsourced directory of female scholars working in Asian religions. Um, and it collected um, data about the scholars, including their names, their titles, their institutions, um, as well as longitude and latitude data for those institutions um, and their research areas. So the faculty member was also interested in adding a map feature to the new site. Um, and this here is a screenshot of the, the new site. So this is currently how it looks post migration. Um, and they wanted the map feature to show the scholars and their institutions as data points on the map. Um, so the, the crowdsourced data that came along with the original site, um, of course, had some inconsistencies, as is usually the case. So the geodata that I had to work with was um, pretty incomplete and not very reliable since it was crowdsourced. So for this project, um, which relied on geodata in order for the mapping application to work, I decided just to scrap what I had um, and kind of start from scratch. To do that, I would need to um, 
normalize the institution names and then connect with an outside data source to pull in location information about those institutions with the end goal being to um, enhance the data with with the geo coordinates that the mapping application would require. Um, so in the past, when I've had a normalization project like this, I've turned to OpenRefine. Um, OpenRefine is a really useful tool for data normalization. And what I um, in particular like about it is its reconciliation function. Um, so reconciliation means that you can um, take any data in your data set and try and match it with an outside data source like a library authority. Um, so this will work provided that outside data source does um, have a web service that's set up to work with OpenRefine. So I've used this in the past with LC names um, and LCSH and library authorities like that. So for this project, my um, approach was going to be kind of the same. Um, I was familiar with LC names, so I thought that was a pretty good target for which to reconcile my institution names against. And this is a screenshot of um, what data looks like after it has been run through a reconciliation job in OpenRefine. So in blue are terms that have found successful matches with the external data source. Um, and where you see check mark boxes, that's where that's when the tool has not found a clear match, but is instead presenting a suggested match. So it's up to the user to accept that by checking the box. Um, but I did a little digging and looked at Wikidata to see how that might help with this project. And I realized that for a lot of the entities um, that represented institutions in my list, um, it, they contained properties that um, included coordinate location, which was essentially the geo data that I was seeking. So this is really great news because I realized I could possibly use Wikidata for all of the cleanup work that I need to do, to do as well as the metadata enhancement um, by way of pulling in those geo coordinates through this coordinate location property. Um, so my workflow was simplified. On the left is my kind of rough plan for kind of how I thought I would approach this data cleanup and reconciliation project. Um, so connecting with, with library authorities through open or fine reconciliation, and then um, doing the same for cities, and then getting some geodata um, as a third step using those city names. And then it became a kind of much more simple process of just really two steps, um, which was to reconcile institutions against Wikidata, and then go and grab that geodata through the coordinate location property. And that was it. So I basically could skip the whole um, city intermediate step. And what I really liked about this project is um, the, the Wikidata reconciliation process really mirrored how I approach um, data cleanups project generally, which is to first normalize and then enhance or enrich the data if it's possible to do so. Um, for this project, it wasn't really important for me to use library authorities because this was a standalone website. It wasn't going to be incorporated into the catalog. Um, so I had kind of an, an excuse to sort of experience the freedom of going outside of library authorities and using Wikidata. Um, and it was so exciting to do this that I got to thinking about how else I could apply Wikidata to um, other collections metadata. So um, I was particularly interested in how it could be used for campus building names. Um, so when we describe photographs of photographs or materials related to buildings on campus, um, we have a kind of local vocabulary that is mostly derived from facilities data. But as is commonly the case with university buildings, um, sometimes the official name is different than the colloquial name. And recently I had a question from an archivist about incorporating the word skyscraper into descriptions of this building here 
which is um, the Mundelein Center for Fine and Performing Arts. This is on Loyola's campus. Um, so she was interested in doing this because the building is commonly known as the skyscraper, um, especially by alumni of Mundelein College, which was an all women institution that operated out of this building before the college was merged with Loyola in the 90s. So interestingly enough, um, Wikidata had an, an entry for Mund Mundelein College skyscraper and it did use this term skyscraper in the title. And what's more, the entity record had properties that could enhance our descriptive metadata. So much like the, the institution names when I you know, investigated those in Wikidata, um, there are useful properties here too, such as the name of the architect who built the building um, and its architectural style. Finally, the identities property at the bottom included the Chicago Landmarks identifier, which connects the, this entity with the Chicago data portal um, that also has an open API. So it's easy to imagine the potential from here, um, pulling in identifiers from Wikidata so that um, I could, with this project or in a future project, also connect with this data source. Um, in order to further enhance the data with information that's in um, an open data portal like this. So I will say that I did a search, I was curious to, just to see how many other buildings on our campus were represented in Wikidata and there, there are only four. Um, so this is, this I guess has limited use. If I tried a reconciliation project with our building names in the same way I did for the maps project, it wouldn't have the same success. Um, but this has sort of reminded me of a, a presentation I heard earlier in this conference, um, Wikidata for Archives from Elizabeth Roque. Um, and she kind of described that the application of Wikidata or linked data is um, just one option among many. Um, so the a kind of good question to ask is what does it do better than what we're currently using um, and an all or nothing approach isn't isn't really the right way. So for this, it wouldn't, um, you know, integrating that Wikidata information for the Mundelein building, the Mundelein skyscraper, um, isn't necessarily something that's great for everything in that collection, but it would be useful potentially um, for certain photographs and certain materials related to that building. Um, so I think that's kind of points to how a community-based system like Wikidata, uh, what, it, what it does well. So what it does um, a little better than maybe other systems that we use for authorities, which is it does provide um, a colloquial name for things because it's a community-based system. So I did touch on the technical benefits of Wikidata with my um, very uh, a kind of complicated data cleanup project that was made, I felt a lot easier um, through data cleanup and enhancement using open refine reconciliation. And finally, I think that there is a um, educational use here too. If you are new to linked data like I was when I started using um, the Wikidata reconciliation function, I I really ended up learning quite a bit about linked data um, just in the process of, of using this plugin in OpenRefine. So just sort of seeing the ease with which you can connect to entities and then from their pull and properties, um, it really demonstrates how the underlying data structure um, of linked data makes automated tasks like this possible. So it's, um, I think, a really good use case of the practical um, like utility of linked data. So that is it for my presentation. I think we're taking questions now, so go ahead. Yes, we've got one question in the Q&A so far um, from Adam Schiff. Have you considered creating Wikidata items for the campus buildings? Yes. Um, so for the for the Mundelein example, I was, you know, thinking about well, okay, what next? Like, how do I 
how do I put that in the metadata? There's obviously a, a lot of different options there. Um, and I thought probably a good place to start was to edit that um, entity to include the current name of the building, um, which would, you know, as it's kind of a, the, the edits in Wikidata can be sort of an iterative thing. I would also need to create an entity for um, the current building perhaps, or um, the, the center that's now housed in that building, um, which does not have an entity in Wikidata. So I, I have thought about that. Um, and I have heard a few presentations in this conference that kind of step through the process that you could take and things to consider when doing that. So I'm really happy to be kind of further educated um, in how to get started with something like that. And Adam adds, um, we also did SACO proposals for our campus buildings. So they are in LCSH and have linked data from id.loc.gov. Um, let's see our next question um, from Bob. Simple nuts and bolts question. How did you download the data and get it into OpenRefine and how did you get it back? That's a great question. I had some some slides kind of about the, the nuts and bolts part of this. And I took them out because um, in the interest of time and also because OpenRefine's documentation is really, really excellent. Um, and so that's, that's easily findable um, with the Google search, it's on GitHub. But the, the answer to your question is you, um, as long as your spreadsheet is in CSV format, you simply download the, the program from GitHub and then upload the CSV into the application. Um, so all of that works in your browser. So um, you can really kind of use it with any machine. And uh, once it's in OpenRefine, you can save the project and return to it and um, kind of do edits over time. Bob says, thank you. Welcome. And I've got another question from Christine. Did you create Wikidata items for the scholars of Asian uh, religions in your first example? Apologies if you already said so and I missed it. And if so, what was your workflow like? And um, did you do any analysis of how many of those items had links to Library of Congress name authority file already? So. No, I didn't, I didn't create entities for the scholars. Um, I just, I, I, so for, for both of these examples, I didn't create entities at all. Um, I just used what was already in Wikidata um, as a, in order to reconcile my messy data against something else. Um, in this case, Wikidata, because it was a great way to normalize um, my data. So, um, Although the question about doing analysis to see what's already in in library authorities is interesting and actually be, I, I would like to do that with the institution names um, because that was um, in, in the map project that was what we were reconciling against Wikidata. Um, and I know there's a fairly good coverage in LC names. So that would be kind of interesting to see. And, and that was you know, knowing that it, the institutions do have good coverage in LC names was why I was initially planning to just use that. Um, but what, and I, I, I could be wrong, but what LC names wouldn't be able to help with is um, also providing geographical information in the um, decimal format that the map application required. And Wikidata did that. So, um, that's, I think, in this case, you know, one of the big differences for this project in using Wikidata rather than LC names. But yeah, I would, I would be interested to see how many of those um, institution entities have LC names links in the identifier section. Christian says, thank you. Uh, we've got another question from Joan. In your example, you note that you were able to skip the location since Wikidata provided the geocoordinates. Was there a way to generate place names from the geocoordinates? Yeah, there, there was another property in the institution entities in Wikidata um, that provided the, the um, city and state 
or maybe just the city. It was, it was, um, I, I don't remember the name. It was like located in um, property or I'm sure <laughs> someone knows exactly what it is who's listening right now. But um, that, that would have been something if I wanted to add in city data, so correct city data, um, I could have also gotten it from Wikidata um, if I just called, called out that property. Thanks, Greer. And that looks like in the chat, Robert and Christine are both saying uh, located in administrative territory is the Wikidata yeah. property. <laughs> <laughs> um, and another question from Adam, it would be great if, or maybe it's just a comment, it would be great if um, NACO and SACO allowed coordinate data in NARS and subject authorities for corporate bodies and buildings. Currently only coordinates can be given for jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is, in my, in my experience working with digital collections metadata, especially for um, archives and university archives, it's kind of tricky, right? Like having um, a sensible way to represent that information, the building names. Um, there's a lot of research and dedication records and also keeping up with various bodies on campus that um, record that information and sort of maintain it. So um, it was, it's nice to have this sort of, you know, it, it couldn't, you know, using Wikidata for our building names couldn't be the primary um, authority because in the Mundelein skyscraper example, it's technically not called that anymore, but um, you know, it's a nice way to augment institutional data. It looks like there's a follow up from Christine in regards to um, adding coordinates. Would that data need to be qualified with chronological data? I guess meaning. Um, point in time. Um, I don't know if I know enough about that, the relationship there to answer that. Um, um, Christina is saying it was more a comment for Adam. So, um, um. <laughs> so sorry, thanks. Um, and we have one last question. Uh, great present from Jessica. Great presentation. Do you link out to Wikidata entities from your digital collections at the item level? For example, do the photos of the Mundelein College skyscraper link to Wikidata, or did you pull in the metadata from Wikidata into your local vocab? Um, so I haven't done anything with it yet. Um, that this was kind of just a thought experiment applied to um, digital collections it being inspired from the map project. But I would like to do potentially both of those things or that those are the kinds of actions I'm thinking through. Um, just kind of what would be useful. I mean, certainly, I think what's nice is it at minimum um, makes me feel a little confident, a, a little more confident about adding that former building name into some some element data element in the metadata so that it's a findable um, it's findable in a search when alumni of Mundelein College search for the skyscraper and that was the motivation for the archivist's kind of question about that um, because she knew that that's how alumni think of the building so it you know has a new name now but that that their time there predates the the new name dedication. So um, yeah, I, I am thinking through how to connect those and at minimum just put it directly, those terms directly in the metadata, um, maybe as their own field so that it could be indexed separately. Thank you. And it looks like there's a couple more comments in relation to the coordinates and uh, chronological subfields that Adam is saying. Um, he doesn't think the 034 allows the recording of a time span, but there's no reason Mark can be revived, revised to include chronological subfields. And 
We also have a comment in chat from Anna. It'd also be really useful if Open Refine had a way to pull an authority record info the way it can for Wikidata. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that was um, another original inspiration. Was I was uh, you know hunting a little bit for the for the latest endpoint for the LC authorities, and I did this a year ago. So perhaps that's all um, more obvious now, but you know, Wikidata is right there. So I just like gave that a shot and, um, and the rest of the project followed. So yeah, it'd be nice if it were a little easier. Thank you so much, Greer. That was an excellent presentation and I really enjoyed learning about your reconciliation process for um, both of your projects. Um, and if anyone has any further questions, um, you're welcome to jump on over to our Slack channel and follow up there uh, and continue the discussion. And in the meantime, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeff Mixter. He will be presenting on using IIIF to help improve search and discovery of digital cultural heritage material um, and works as a software engineer at OCLC Membership and Research. His work focuses on linked data and digital humanities research. He holds bachelor's degrees in history and German from the Ohio State University, as well as master's degrees in library information science and information architecture and knowledge management from Kent State University. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jeff. Thank you uh, for everyone uh, joining us today and thanks for uh, Winnie and Hillary for uh, facilitating this and uh, for Greer for co-presenting with me. Um, so today, uh, my, my talk uh, presentation is going to be sort of a tale of two projects. Um, both of these projects focus around IIIF uh, and its capability to share and use uh, digital materials. Um, but these, these tales are sort of divergent in the way um, that we created, uh, managed, and used the metadata to facilitate uh, discovery in our prototype applications. So just as a little bit of quick background, um, just for some terms I'll be using throughout the presentation. Um, IIIF um, is an acronym for the International Image Inter Interoperability Framework. Uh, it's a consortium designed to create both community of practice as well as APIs uh, for describing and sharing digital materials on the web. Uh, Content EM uh, is uh, OCLC's digital repository service um, for building and showcasing uh, cultural heritage materials and collections. And then finally, um, Wikibase um, is a, a piece of software. Uh, it's the infrastructure um, for um, Wikidata, and it's used to um, store, manage, and create um, semi-structured and structured data about um, primarily entities, as uh, Greer was talking about in her presentation. So um, the first sort of project or tale here is one of sort of mass aggregation and what can you do um, algorithmically at scale uh, with cultural heritage materials um, and specifically the, the metadata used to describe those materials uh, to facilitate discovery. So in this project, uh, which we ran um, in the beginning of 2019, so the beginning of last year, um, my coworker, uh, Bruce Washburn, and I uh, developed a prototype um, API following the currently being developed IIIF change discovery API. And um, within that API, we were able to put um, uh, about 13 million uh, content DM uh, items, um, which corresponded to about 20 million images. Um, and from this API, it was um, being used to test uh, the the um, creation of this IIIF API. Um, we harvested uh, the metadata from these 13 million content DM collections. And then we went about taking the metadata and um, um, sort of enhancing, uh, enhancing quote unquote, and um, mapping it. Um, and I guess more broadly sort of linkifying or linking the metadata strings. So uh, we started looking across um, all the metadata fields that were associated with Dublin core fields. Um, and then from all the terms within those fields, we looked at terms that, were, that occurred or were used uh, more than 2,000 times 
across the 13 million um, metadata records we harvested. And um, from there, we used, um, actually used OpenRefine, uh, as Greer talked about using on the previous presentation, to reconcile those terms to uh, control vocabularies. Um, so we reconciled against uh, FAST, um, as well as VOF, and then uh, we also worked with the Wikidata a little bit as well. So what we had was sort of a, a very, very large set of um, um, diverse materials um, that had had their metadata, um, which was very heterogeneous across the corpus, um, sort of mapped to Dublin Core and enhanced where possible. And with all of that metadata, we were then um, able to build a prototype application that allowed for sort of a single point of entry search um, across those 13 million um, items. Um, so you can visit that website if you want. Um, I should note that th this project uh, was run um, between January and May of last year. Um, so the data has not been refreshed since May. Um, so just, just a caveat, if you are using that search, uh, you have to using that site, um, it is uh, it's no longer an actively maintained service, um, though it is still, um, still usable. So um, if you were to go to that service um, and do a search, uh, one, of, one of my favorite musicians uh, being a, a jazz musician um, in a past life, um, just doing a search for Louis Armstrong, um, you find um, about 517 um, items associated with uh, Louis Armstrong. And um, you can see on the, the left some sort of simple fastening. Uh, this fastening was based off of the metadata reconciliation we did during the harvesting portion of the project. And if you were then to click on a specific image, um, you would pull up, um, you can see here the image itself. Um, this is all being driven by IIIF. Um, so this image viewer here is uh, the open source um, Mirador image viewer that's developed out of Stanford. Um, what's nice is, um, again, this is where IIIF becomes really important. Uh, regardless of how ContentDM users um, have sent their metadata, um, are their images specifically, whether they be TIFFs or JPEGs or you know, name, name your image file format of choice, um, because this is all powered by IIIF under the hood, um, we can load any image into from the content DM set into a IIIF viewer um, and have the exact same uniform um, end user experience across any of them. Um, so some of those features include um, deep zooming and panning and, and paging uh, if it happens to be a, a sort of a set of images. Um, and this is makes the, the user experience uh, much more um, appealing and uniform. Then on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see some of the metadata reconciliation work um, at, um, that we did. So you can see things like subject headings. So these are very sort of high level, very broad subject headings that um, could be useful, um, but as I'll discuss later, um, aren't as useful as, as they could be. Um, you can see that it has sort of a generic type here. In this case, it's a DCMI type for image. Um, and then we were able to, because of using the content DM data, identify that this was an image from Temple University and specifically from the John W. Mosley photographs collection. Um, so, I mean, the in, you know, what we found um, in doing this work was, um, it was actually really, really exciting to find unexpected things in unexpected places. Um, and that's sort of the, the nature of working with a very large aggregation of data from around the world. Um, but when actually working with the data or interacting with the data, we found that um, the reconciliation was, was pretty limited um, based on um, sort of first and foremost, the scale of the data. Um, there was two of us and there were 13 million records, uh, metadata records we were working with. Um, as I'd previously mentioned, um, the metadata we were working with was, was very heterogeneous. So each content DM user um, can define their own sort of metadata template or schema, um, and then also choose either their own terms for, for subjects, let's say, or their own control vocabularies to use with those fields. Um, so you have a wide variety of not only fields that you want to use to describe your metadata, 
but also terms used within those fields to describe your metadata. Um, and then finally, um, just the algorithmic approach to matching um, was, um, was problematic at times when working with headings that were not exactly derived from a controlled vocabulary. So um, in the end, um, what this really was, was an exercise in harvesting and mapping record-based data um, for the purposes of discovery. So while it was very um, worthwhile in that it gave us a view of content DM data that we'd not seen before, the sort of 13 million record aggregation view, um, it also had, um, albeit limited, sort of um, authority-based searching. Um, it still didn't really seem to tap into um, or, or demonstrate the true potential of um, sort of working with linked data and working with entities. So um, the, the next project, uh, we decided to um, take a step back and, and just evaluate what it would be like to sort of create linked data from scratch for, for digital item materials. So for this project, um, we worked very specifically with a small set of users. So we worked with five content DM users um, and initially worked with three collections from each of those users. So we had about 15 collections we were working with. Um, it accounted for approximately 40,000 items. Um, and with those items um, using uh, OpenRefine, we manually reviewed um, both the metadata fields as well as the terms used within those fields. Um, and then we mapped those fields to a new data model that we created um, and we reconciled all, all of the metadata we could um, manually using OpenRefine. Um, the other key difference with this project was um, instead of sort of storing the data in just a new record format um, to be indexed, we actually imported all of this um, mapped and reconciled data into uh, an environment or an ecosystem that could store structured data and actually be interacted with to manage and curate that data. So um, from a previous project, uh, we had worked with Wikibase um, and we thought that that would be a fantastic environment or um, system to work with in this pilot as well. So um, after we've done this manual review, mapping and reconciliation, um, which, which I should note, uh, while, while Bruce and I did sort of the manual work, um, we had to rely heavily on the domain expertise of the collection curators. So we had um, at least one one hour session with each of the um, participants to go over what we'd seen in their metadata and ask questions about fields and terms and um, cataloging practices and things like that. So um, I, I did not mean to imply that we were doing all the work. We did just the, the manual portion of it, but we never could have done this work unless we had um, the, uh, the hands on, you know, on the ground domain expertise of the people um, who actually curate and create these collections at their organizations. So once we had this data um, sort of in a Wikibase environment um, that could now be used for both data retrieval, um, data modification, new data creation, um, we built a, a new prototype application um, to sort of search and explore across um, this, this Wikibase um, uh, data. So again, here is, is the, the new UI for this new application we're working on right now. Again, here's a search just for uh, Louis Armstrong. Um, you can quickly see that the results are much smaller and because we're only working with about 40,000 um, items, uh, there's only 10 results. Um, but um, just to um, compare and contrast, here is that same image um, from the previous project. And again, uh, you have all the really um, nice triple IF utility of panning and deep zooming um, sort of at a, in a uniform um, level across all the items. Um, but you can see on the right hand side that the, um, the reconciled metadata, um, there's not only more of it, um, but it, it's more specific and more granular. So now, um, as opposed to the 
this thing just being classified as an image. Uh, we can actually say it's more specifically classified as a photograph um, and that the process or format used in this photograph was black and white prints. Um, we have um, subjects down here. Um, some of these subjects you saw in the previous sort of high level algorithmic reconciliation, for example, jazz, um, composers, United States, uh, but you also see some more specific or more um, maybe um, granular um, subject headings. And I think most importantly, you can see um, that we were able to suss out some semantics in the metadata. So you can see at the very bottom, um, there's this depicts Louis Armstrong, which is, is really important because um, Louis Armstrong is no longer just a subject of this photograph, but you can actually in structured data declare that um, Louis Armstrong is actually depicted in this photograph, um, as opposed to just having a, a general subject like jazz or singers um, associated with the, uh, with the image. So um, you know, to demonstrate the utility of this, if you were to click on that Louis Armstrong hot link there, um, what you'd be presented with is a new search result. Um, and in the initial search result, when we just did a string search for Louis Armstrong, it came back with 10 results. Um, but now what we're actually doing in the system is um, asking a structured data question. So we're asking for images that um, are that have claims in them that say that this image depicts um, this specific identifier here, which um, in our case is an identifier for Louis Armstrong. Um, so again, because of the scale of the data we're working with, this doesn't seem that dramatic. It dropped the results from 10 to eight results. Um, but this does demonstrate how structure, well-structured data that's backed by um, identifiers related to entities um, can facilitate um, more granular uh, pinpoint search queries um, that will um, you know, decrease um, recall, um, but in theory should increase the precision of those searches. So I'd, I'd mentioned that we are storing all of this data um, in a wiki base. So um, while the UI does not um, take advantage of this right now, something that Bruce and I are working on is being able to leverage um, more of the contextual structured data um, about related entities in the user experience. So again, we had mentioned that you know, Louis Armstrong as an entity is claimed to be depicted in this image. Um, Louis Armstrong himself is actually also an entity within the Wikibase system that we had deployed. Um, so if we went out to that system and looked at his identifier, we would see um, uh, obviously a description of him, um, his name and um, aliases in, in various languages. And then we'd also see some statements about, about him, um, birth date, um, classification, um, we also have links out to um, Wikipedia, or to Wikidata, and other um, various authority files like FAST and LCNEF in this case. So this UI also takes advantage of those external links to be able to pull in um, abstracts or descriptions of um, of the entity that we are that you're focused on, assuming we have those links. So this is actually an abstract from um, DBpedia which is, is more or less derived from uh, Wikipedia. So again, we're interested in how can we leverage this um, contextual information about um, subjects related to a photograph in the UI, the, the end user discovery system itself to help facilitate um, uh, discovery or you know, I, I guess in some sense, potentially some serendip serendipitous um, data discovery. Um, the other advantage we found in working with um, the Wikibase system, because it is a very well structured um, environment for creating and editing and storing data, is um, we were able to sort of combine the advantages of Wikibase as a platform for describing linked data and IIIF as a set of APIs for um, describing and encoding the digital images themselves to build um, mashup applications to add, to add additional knowledge to the metadata. 
So one of those um, applications we developed, we called um, we call the um, Content DM Image Annotator, where you can take an image that we have described and put it into Wikibase, um, load it into this application um, that has a cropping tool built into it, and then the application goes off to the Wikibase instance and pulls over all of the about and depicts claims that have been made about this item. And then what uh, a user can do is review these and, for example, chain, change some of them. So as opposed to saying that this photograph is about musicians um, or is about specifically jazz musicians, you can say this actually depicts musicians or depicts entertainers or depicts jazz musicians. And even more granularly, um, we had already had that claim that Louis Armstrong was depicted in this image. Uh, you can also then sort of crop out um, the specific portion of the image that represents um, or that visualizes this claim that Louis Armstrong is depicted in this image. And then we can go even more granularly and say, there's also this thing depicted in this new knowledge that was not from the original metadata um, and claim that there is a thing called a trumpet that is depicted in this image. And then once you've done all this um, either data modification, enhancement, or in this case, new knowledge creation, you can push all of this back to the wiki based data and store it there as well. Um, so the image uh, digital representation URLs you see here, this is where IIIF becomes really important um, in that one of its key features is the ability to create uh, URIs for subsections of an image based on um, pixel offsets for the digital image itself. So um, now we have not only in the metadata um, really granular descriptions of things that are depicted in the photograph, but we can actually also push all this information back into the IIIF context. So if someone is just um, not, if someone is looking at the image itself and not necessarily all the metadata associated with it, they can still see that there are these annotations uh, within the IIIF um, API context, um, specifically focusing on um, this, in this case, Louis Armstrong, um, in this case, uh, a trumpet that he happens to be playing. So um, the findings from this, this ongoing pilot is that um, it takes a lot of human effort um, to create and curate uh, the structured data. Um, but Wikibase is a very powerful and flexible infrastructure for creating, managing, and curating this data. It has a very robust set of APIs for interacting with the application if you want to build your own um, sort of mashup or additional applications like we do with the annotator. Um, and that using tools like the annotator, there's a lot of potential for enhancing existing metadata about cultural heritage items. Um, to either fit the need of um, online learning, uh, which is obviously important now, or just to better address the, the needs or expectations of any user interacting with or searching for uh, cultural heritage materials. So the next steps for this project um, are that we'd like to better evaluate the, the balance of sort of algorithmic record conversion and reconciliation um, with the um, needed domain expertise um, for, for making sure things are correct. Um, we'd also like to better determine how to pull apart contextual metadata from the sort of item descriptive metadata. So, um, what we saw um, all frequently were in, for example, that image of Louis Armstrong, um, the image description um, would say something to the extent of a photograph of Louis Armstrong playing a trumpet, uh, but then would go on to have a full description of who Louis Armstrong uh, was. Um, and that is this necessary, that was obviously necessary because of the sort of the record-based nature of, of cultural heritage, or of metadata in general right now. Um, but in sort of a linked data world, um, you don't need that, that contextual descriptive metadata 
embedded in the item metadata if you simply have a link out to uh, an entity description for Louis Armstrong, let's say in this case. Um, and then also, as I'd mentioned earlier, we'd like to learn how to sort of better leverage the contextual metadata in an end user application to not um, not bombard users with a bunch of unnecessary or a bunch of information that at the time at the immediate time might not be necessary, um, but make that information available to them um, when it's needed and if it's needed. So um, that is it. Uh, thank you very much. And I guess we can open it up for questions. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, looks like we've got a few questions. Uh, the first from Meredith. What percentage of headings were you able to match with reconciliation? Um, for, for the first one, uh, we were purposefully scoping it down. Um, so it was sort of artificially small because we were only even looking at headings that um, occurred more than 2,000 times. So I would say that was in probably the low teens percentage of reconciliation. And when you look at all of the terms usable um, across them, um, but conversely for, for the, the second pilot where we were sort of manually reviewing and manually reconciling terms in open or fine, um, that percentage was much higher. I mean, much closer to the sort of 80, 20 rule. Um, where we were able to reconcile about 80-ish percent. Um, and then for the other 20%, um, we did our best to actually create new entities in the Wikibase system. Um, and where this became most useful was in terms of working with personal names. So um, when we were working with collections, especially from um, like um, historical societies, there were a lot of people referenced um, that because they were not, have not published something, um, they were not in name authority files. So we had a mechanism for creating kind of um, stub person entities, if you will, that we then had the intention of asking the data experts to go back and try to add additional um, statements to if they were able to. Thank you. And another question from Lena. Are you able to include multi-sheet items or only single sheet? So we, that was one of the modeling challenges. So do the IIIF um, um, APIs allow for, for multi-paged item or multi-sheet um, um, items, if you will. So like a manuscript, for example, where all the pages have been individually digitized. Um, IIIF is fantastic at basically stitching those all back together and then making them shareable. Um, from a metadata perspective though, um, we were primarily focused on having sort of one metadata description per item. If that item happened to be multiple pages, um, we still had one description for it. Um, so one of the, I guess uh, we should add this to our, our next steps. One of the other issues we need to resolve is if you have a collection of images where that have been bundled together for some reason or another, let's say it's a scrapbook, um, and each of the images has unique or individual metadata associated with it, that's something we need to evaluate. Um, we prototyped it a little bit in the Wikibase environment. Um, and, and had a, um, a, a couple of different ways to go about it, um, but we did not settle on sort of a best practice approach for a situation where you have multiple items or multiple images associated with a single metadata record um, in which those individual items have sort of a unique metadata associated with them. Thank you. And from Kate, what happens if multiple institutions have the same item? So in our system, uh, well, in the Wikibase system, um, Wikibase requires that an item have, per a given language, a unique label and description. Um, so that would be the first sort of barrier, making sure that these two basically identical items um, didn't share the same, the exact same label and exact same description. Um, but once you get over that technical barrier, 
um, there could be um, two descriptions in the Wikibase system uh, or environment, one for um, you know, photograph of Louis Armstrong from Temple and one for photograph of Louis Armstrong from uh, the Ohio State University. They could be the exact same image, um, but in theory, they would have at least somewhat different descriptive metadata um, in terms of like the, the collection that these digital images are part of or um, maybe when it was digitized, um, though we focused it uh, for the purpose of our project, we were focused on um, descriptions of the physical item, not really um, descriptive um, details of the digital item. Um, but you know, the likelihood of two images having the exact same physical descriptive characteristics being put in the system we thought was relatively low. Um, but if that happened, um, there are ways that you could um, you know, link them together. Um, you, know, you could use a simple, like, well, not simple, you could use a same as, um, you could see the C also or something like that. Um, and we also experimented a little bit with um, image recognition software um, that might be able to um, just algorithmically detect if there are two exact duplicate digital images um, in your repository or in our sort of ecosystem um, and then find where they're described in the metadata. Thanks. And another question, is there a special reason why the Q numbers on your wiki base are different to those in Wikidata itself? There, L. Armstrong has Q1779. Yeah, so the way um, wiki, the wiki base infrastructure works is um, it is the data is completely separate from the data in Wikidata. Um, so when you set up a Wikibase instance, um, the very first entity you create will be Q1. And then it's just a, um, an increasing uh, number after that. Um, so the way we resolved that disconnect was for, um, for example, our Louis Armstrong that had Q7, whatever it was, um, that is a Q identifier for our installation of Wikibase for the URL or URI pattern that we have for that installation. And then within that description of Louis Armstrong, we have a link out to the Wikidata queue identifier for Louis Armstrong. So they are sort of two um, distinct, separately managed entities with their respective descriptive properties, um, but we connected them together via a statement pointing from our description to the Wikidata description. Great. Um, another question. Aside from the link to the image fragment, what kind of description is created for the new trumpet item in your wiki base in the example that you showed? Would you later expect to describe it further manually or reconcile it with an external description? This feature is very, very cool. So um, the uh, outside of just cropping it out and saying that it's a depiction of a trumpet, um, if we go, let me go back to that actually. Um, you can see that in the, in the wiki base description, that trumpet there is actually a hyperlink. Um, it's a hyperlink to a new, a different entity within the wiki base um, that describes what a trumpet is. Um, in, in this case, um, that term trumpet was derived from the control vocabulary heading um, for trumpet in FAST, in OCLC's FAST vocabulary. Um, which itself is a, a derivation of LCs, uh, LCSH in this case. So the descriptive properties you would see for that um, are somewhat thin um, in, in that they're, they're derived from control vocabularies. Um, but you could, um, with no problem at all, add you know, additional statements to that entity for trumpet saying, you know, who invented the trumpet or when was it first manufactured or, um, or other descriptive information about trumpets in general. Um, you could also, if you wanted to more granularly describe this specific trumpet, like it's a, um, a Bach trumpet or a Benj trumpet or something like that, um, you could add additional qualifiers to this claim you know, right here. The only qualifier we have here is that the digital representation URL for this thing is this image, but you could add, um, you know, the if you happen to name the trumpet um, or the year this specific trumpet was manufactured, you could add additional 
contextual metadata as um, what Wikibase calls um, um, annotations in, in the Wikibase system. Qualifiers, I'm sorry, not annotations, qualifiers. And Christine adds, um, she's wondering about the use cases for enhancement by researchers and other end users and what kinds of permissioning might be needed for that. Yeah, um, right now, um, it, one of the reasons we are, uh, I did not share all the URLs for this second part, second phase um, applications is right now the system is very open um, and um, sort of in a, also in a, a very much beta sense. Um, so yeah, there would have to be some restrictions obviously added to you know, who can create these annotations, um, what the annotation is for, um, and we're working and we've talked with our various pilot participants to come up with um, use cases for doing this type of work. And then um, ideally we could come up with um, sort of credentials or requirements for an individual creating annotations for those use cases. Thank you. And one last question from Laura. Does this work give you a sense of limitations of Dublin Core and might this lead institutions to want to use a different type of schema? Yeah, so our, our work in the first pilot where we were uh, very much focused on just the Dublin Core mapping to the metadata um, did present uh, immediate limitations um, in that you would see um, locally defined fields like um, depicts or um, um, subject in parentheses depicted place um, indicating that it's sort of an about relationship but it's really um, more of a depicted place description all of those sort of granular metadata fields being mapped to simple Dublin core about or sub subject sorry um, so there was an obvious limitation there um, and one of the reasons we sort of launched the second pilot where we actually didn't bother looking at the Dublin core fields, we looked at the sort of the locally defined fields for the metadata that were actually created by the um, digital collection curators. Um, and from there, we basically built a, our own data model to um, encompass the, the breadth and depth of um, field names or fields that we saw across the metadata we were working with. Um, so um, I, I guess I, I'd sort of have a um, maybe a contradictory answer, which is yes, I mean, this did, did show the limitations of Dublin Core, um, but at the same time, if you want to create, curate, and manage sort of, I guess, for lack of a term, higher fidelity metadata, um, like we were able to create in this pilot um, that exponentially increases the, the effort required, um, not only, or mostly from a sort of domain expertise perspective. Um, so there's a trade off between um, simply adding as many links to meta the metadata as possible to sort of linkify your data um, versus really re reevaluating the way you create and curate metadata for um, cultural heritage materials. Thank you so much, Jeff. We've got a lot of comments in the chat saying they, that people can't wait to see what you figure out. And this is really exciting to see and really interesting to see the ability to not just update the information about an entity and image, but also the ability to target a particular portion of an image. So thank you so much for such an excellent presentation and demo of the tool. And um, if anyone has any questions that come up uh, later on, you're welcome to add them uh, over Slack in our uh, digital collections track um, channel. And um, so thank you so much both Greer and Jeff for your presentations today. Um, we are have recorded them so they'll be made available as soon as we can. And thank you all to everyone for joining today and asking such great questions. Um, it's been a really wonderful past hour and I've, I feel like I've learned a lot myself. Um, so thank you all for being here. And our um, digital collections track continues on Friday and uh, tomorrow, Thursday is Wikidata track. So we hope to see you at more sessions and thank you all.
have a great rest of the day or evening wherever you are.